Praise God. I'm so glad you're here again. We got a we got a long way to go and a short time to get there. I feel a lot of Burt Reynolds and uh, Smokey and the Bandit, but uh, I, I want to tell you that we've been we've been in uh, this. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't necessarily call it a series. It's the past three Bible studies we've done, and this one right here would be the fourth one in a uh, I guess you call it a series. A group of four is called the Highway of Holiness, and we started out in Isaiah 35. Come on. Good girl. We started we started out in Isaiah 35, 8, where uh, God was talking about gathering up his people, gathering up the redeemed, and that there will be a highway of holiness. There will be a highway and a road. There will be a thoroughfare and a road. There will be two ways you can go. There's two ways. There's blessings and cursings that sit before you, and that God is calling us in a thoroughfare. We learned it was a place or a way of two passage. Then we got to reading about in 2 Samuel how King David was on the way to his third fair. He was on the third fair with his mighty men and how he was uh, persecuted by the Benjamin, Benjaminite um, that, that came and persecuted him of his past, his, his, his uh, position and his family and brought up everything to him. But, uh, but he, he, instead he just said, let God, let God judge this and God will bless me because this man talking bad about me. But then we also, on the, on the third Bible study, um, and this, the very last one, we were, we were in uh, Matthew, where we talked about the rich young ruler. Now, I just want to touch on this a minute and how he went on a journey. Uh, and he had all these possessions. Let me, let me reframe that. He, he had all these possessions, and he wanted to follow Christ on a journey. You know, he, he was wanting to get on the third affair. But Christ said to leave all your possessions, give it to the poor. Do like my father has given his prized possession, his only begotten son, and then follow me. Christ says to follow him. And so what he was saying is like we talked about the eye of the needle, how it was easier for a rich man to go through it, uh, for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to get to heaven, meaning that the needle gate, the gate that was so small on the outskirts of Jerusalem where it would only a man could get through there, not a man on his camel or his backpack. You would have to be stripped down and you would have to strip down. And it's a personal thing that to go through that passage and through that thoroughfare where you need to get to, you would have to strip down all whatever that's driving you, whether it be money, possession, square footage, or uh, bigness, or whatever it is, materialism, you know, that bring us on, brings us also to the road that I want to address tonight. And it's on a Friday night, so I'm going to... I want to tell you, this is how we're getting down on a Friday night, but uh, this is a trip. It's on Acts chapter 9. We want to talk about the road to Damascus when Saul, which would be not named Paul once he was converted, but we're going to talk about the conversion of Saul to Paul. And Saul was persecuting the church. He was a zealot. He was so, he, everything he did, he did it in, in a zealot type. He was very zealous. You know, he was just, he did it with, with all his might. You know, he's like sort of like obsessive compulsive, I guess. He just he was going to do it. If he was going to do it, he was going to do it right. And he was not only killing men, he was killing men and women. He held the coast while they stoned Stephen. He was he was a basically a murderer. And I want you to join us right now. It says if you get your Bibles, it's in Acts chapter nine, verse one. It says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. And he asked from letters from him from the synagogues of Damascus so that he would find anyone who were of the way. And interesting, he was asking to find out who had been going there serving the Lord. He was pinpointing just those. He was pinpointing Christians. He was wanting to murder the disciples of the Lord. He was wanting to murder Christian folk that had been in the synagogue, that had been in Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, and that the way there is capitalized way, the way, so there we know that Christ is the way. And that is just like a thoroughfare. It is a way, a place or a way to passage. So he was wanting to find anybody else that was on the thoroughfare while he was on the road to Damascus. You get where I'm going with this? It says that, and, and uh, then it says, he wanted to know of those who were of the way, whether they be men or women. It didn't matter if they were men or women. He was going to kill them both because they were of the way. They were on the highway of holiness. They were on the thoroughfare. And he was on the road, you see. There's a difference there. And he so that he may be so he could bring them back to Jerusalem and they would be stoned. And as Saul journeyed, you read down in uh, verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus. He was almost to his destination on the road. And suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground. Now I want to tell you, if he was journeying. It doesn't say he was on a camel, but I'm pretty sure it says he fell from the fell to the ground. It says fell to the ground. 
I believe he was probably on top of his camel, just like that that gate we was talking about, the needle gate, you know. So he was meeting the Lord, and it just had to be just him. He had to get up, get off what he was riding on. You see, he had to be by himself. And it says he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And and Saul said, and he said, Who are you, Lord? Who? And, uh, I'm sorry. He said, Who are you, Lord? He questioned. Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Now, the goads was a stick they used to uh, drive cattle with. It had spikes on it. So he was saying, why are you kicking against something that is used to drive cattle? So you're not going to win. You're kicking against a spike. You see what I'm saying? You're hurting yourself. Isn't it interesting how we're, we're running to self and we're on that road that we are very self-destructive? You know, it's, we're very self-destructive. It, it's not God ain't against us. If you don't have Christ in your life and you're having a hard life, it ain't because Christ is against you. Christ is for you. you we're self-destructive when we don't have Christ. You see, because we're, we're self-driven. See, Paul was self-driven on a mission that he, he was so zealous for. He was on a mission for himself. He was trying to make a point, but he wasn't on the right road. Or he was, he was not on the highway of holiness. He was on the road, you see. So Paul, he, as he fell to the ground, he saw, it said he, uh, you know, there was a light. He said he fell to the ground, there was a light that was shone around him. It was Christ's glory. It was his light shedding it on darkness. And he was almost where he was supposed to get to, but the Lord stopped him. And, and basically he was asking him, why do you kick against a spike? Basically we're saying, why are you kicking against something? We're so self-destructive. It says, so then he trembling and astonished, so Saul, trembling in astonishment, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Isn't that interesting? That's exactly what a man, a humble man, instead of, instead of thinking like, this is what I'm going to do, he was willing to do whatever the Lord wanted him to do. That's a man that's got a heart right. That's a heart being changed right there. Here's the conversion right here, where he says, well, Lord, what do you want me to do? I am yours. I am yours. He acknowledged him. He said, who is this? Lord, is it you? And he told him what he was doing was self-driven. You're kicking, you're, you're going against a losing battle. He acknowledged it. And he, he, tr he trembled and was feared God, a godly fear, a godly sorrow. And he was trembling. And he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Praise God, a saved soul right there. Because that's that simple. Then the Lord said to him, arise, arise, hallelujah, and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him, I want you to listen to this, they stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. It's interesting. I'm not saying uh, no one add to this word, but you know, it says they heard a voice, but they saw no one. You know, when you're on that road, on that rocky road that we talked about, that has a lot of rocks and there's a lot of rocks to sling just like they slung at Stephen. And you know, there, when you all, when you're self-driven and you're not doing things, the, doing things the Lord's way, when you're not being spirit-driven, but you're being self-driven and everything is in, into yourself and you're just doing you. You see, you're gonna have a crew of people with you, just like David, when he was on the highway of holiness, had his mighty man with him. Paul had his men with him too. And they were sitting there and they were astonished. They heard a voice, but they didn't see no one. They heard God's voice, but they didn't see the light, you see. They didn't, hear, they didn't, they didn't see things that Paul seen because Christ and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was calling but one person that day, and he was calling on Paul. And he had stripped him down off his camel, what he was driving, that was fixing to take him to do more of what Paul's will was to do, and that's to kill Christians. And Christ stopped him in his tracks, and he had to answer by himself, not with his crew, that, his, that was probably his two best partying guys. It was his, probably some rough characters he was riding with. But it's interesting how, how they heard a voice, but they seen no one, because darkness doesn't comprehend the light. The light shone around. They didn't see that. They didn't see that. They heard a voice. They heard God's voice. Paul was being converted. Paul was being converted. You know, this, 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 this was a, he was a hard case, a hard case that was won that was on the road, on a rocky road, on a road, and he wasn't on the thoroughfare of life. He wasn't on, uh, ne but now Paul was converted. Now Saul was converted, and his name became Paul. And uh, 
Now he's winning souls over. He was blind. Go on and read how he went and, and, and was blind for about three days and didn't eat or drink or whatever. And uh, the Lord said to him, go, and he's a chosen vessel of mine to Ananias. He told Ananias to go pick him up. And he said, I will, he told Ananias that I will show you how many things that Paul must suffer for my namesake. For Paul was a zealot. Christ knew that he was going to be willing to do whatever it took. You know, when it, when he said that he was going to Damascus to get a letter to find out who's been serving the Lord and who's been practicing Christianity, so men or women, he was going to get them stoned or killed either way. He, Paul was the same person that sat in the jail with Silas that said, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is the same man that was going to kill men and women. Now he's calling men and women out. And whoever, whosoever believeth, on the Lord shall be saved. It says, call unto me, and I will show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. That's the Lord said, call unto me. And Jeremiah 33, 3 says, and, and when you call unto me, and you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. For Christ has the plans. Christ has the plans. And he had, he had Paul's planned out also. And that was Paul's conversion. You know, it's interesting. Paul was a zealot before he was converted and killing people. But then he was a zealot. Say, help and save people, lead them to the Lord. You know, you don't, a lot of people think you got to give up a lot of things or you might, you might be changed. You won't be cool. And you know what, Paul, it doesn't say Paul, it doesn't mention these two guys like you went back hanging out with these guys anymore. And it doesn't mention anything about that. But a lot of people think they have to give up something to follow Jesus. You know, it adds to your life. You don't take away from your life. You know, it's, you know, if you're a grumpy man, if you're a grumpy man, you just, you know, I heard a man tell me one time, if you're a grumpy guy, are you just a kind of ornery person and you get saved? You was lost and you just get saved and you're real ornery. You just be an ornery saved person, you see? You know, Paul was a zealot before he, before he was saved and he, and he saw the light of Jesus Christ and now he's become a zealot for Jesus Christ. The Lord would use what, what the devil meant for bad, but he'll turn around and use it for good. It says all things together work for those uh, for God's will for those who call according to His will. You say God will use all things. You see, God uses the foolish things to confound the wise. God uses foolish things like me and you, and He will and for His glory to be revealed. He calls out. He calls us a peculiar people. We're, we are we are not second rate citizens, but we have been chosen. It's just, and it's just like Christ says in John fifteen sixteen. You did not choose me, but I have chose you to bear fruit, and it shall be good. And whatever you pray in His name, it shall remain. You see, we can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. We can convert and stay the same, but use it for good. What the devil meant for for bad, God will use it for good. Paul took his uh, zealous attitude that he had about killing people. Now I couldn't think of a more drastic. Um, you know, a flip side of the coin. I mean, we're talking about somebody that was killing people. Now he's wanting to start preaching Christ. He wanted, and even when he was in jails, he was singing songs and psalms with Silas. And they said, call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved and your house. So when you call upon him as a spiritual leader, men, your house will be saved too. So when a man's right with the Lord, even his enemies will be right with him. They can't help it. They can't comprehend the light. They'll stand and be astonished. And you'll start, you'll change your crew of people. Man, what an amazing thing. He fell to the ground, stripped from his camel. It was just him along a personal relationship, one-on-one uh, -on -one time, some eye-to-eye -eye time with the great maker. What a wonderful thing to hear a testimony of a man who was a murderer, who was a murderer, who watched, watched Stephen get stoned. And Stephen cried out and said, Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And Paul sat there and held the coats and let it go down as they sit there and slung those stones against a Christian man who loved Jesus. Wow. I'm talking about a, if you're on a journey, which you, from this story, it says you're either on a journey on a road or you're either going to be on the journey on the highway of holiness. Paul was on the journey on the road to Damascus. I looked up the road to Damascus on the computer a while ago. There was a lot of rocks on that road. I don't know, I don't know if that's coincidental or what, but it was rocky out there. I'd rather be on the highway of holiness and hold up high spiritual, stand, high spiritual standards and do whatever it takes and be willing and say, Lord, what shall I do? And be willing, have that heart to be able to be molded by God. You know, the, the clay don't tell the potter what it wants to be. We're the clay and he's the potter. Let him let us mold, mold us in the way that he wants to since our life is his and we're not our own.